So there's water. <laughs> I did not want to do this while you were talking, so because I was afraid it was getting too noisy. Thank you so much for your speech and um, you know for for making very clear again what your values are and and where you stand. Can you explain to us and to me what the the term Zizu means, the Finnish term Zizu? I can, but first of all, I must say that I was really blushing in the run, run throw when you spoke so kindly uh, about about me and and the years that we have all witnessed and passed together. Uh, it was really touching uh, to see that video, and it was really goodly done. So thank you everybody for for this uh, award and also also uh, for your kind words. It was really uh, something for Finns. Us Finns, we don't like that kind of attention, so, so it was a, a bit embarrassing and I was really blushing. But what Sisu means? Uh, Sisu means that, that you need guts. Whatever might come on your way, you need guts to go through it. So Finnish people don't give up. Whatever comes in our path, we don't give up. And that, was, that is Sisu. But even... But even the Finns I talked to um, said that it's not only a national quality, but y that you have a lot of it, even compared to other Finns. Do you think that's true? Well, I'm from Tampere. Uh, that's a city in, in Finland, so maybe uh, people from, from Tampere has more Sisu some, than somebody else. But, but I don't know, I have met so many Finnish people, especially during this spring, uh, when we had the election campaign in Finland, and I met so many people, uh, Finnish people, but also actually many Ukrainian people. And I think that if there's some one country that has really that Finnish Sisu, it's Ukraine and Ukrainians. They are fighting every day for the democratic values that we believe in. Um, yes. Why did you decide to apply your Zizu in politics? Well, I was, I was about 20 years old uh, when I entered politics. When I, I was al also, before that, I was interested in many things and, and wanted to change the world. But when I was 20, I, I realized that actually nobody else is doing uh, enough. So it's also my responsibility, not somebody else's responsibility, but also my responsibility to do something, to do something that I really believe in. And the matters that, that really mattered to me, that I wanted to change, was climate change, loss of biodiversity. Um, I wanted to make sure that, that our societies can be sustainable, not only economically and socially, but also environmentally. And also human rights issues. As I mentioned also uh, during the interview in the video, I was raised in a rainbow family and, and uh, equality, human rights, uh, the right that everybody has the right to be happy and, and live fulfilling life are re really important to me. So I entered politics because I wanted to make changes in Finnish society and globally to make sure that everybody has the same opportunities in life, that, that we will leave uh, behind us a planet where our children and their children can live a happy life. It was already uh, mentioned today, you have said at least on one occasion that you've not become a politician to be a politician, but rather to make the world a better place. Have you? Well, I don't think that I have done enough. Not yet. Uh, I will continue on this path, but the... We the do like the not yet part at the Helmut Schmidt Future Award, I yeah. have to say that. Not yet. <laughs> but I also want to uh, encourage uh, people, especially young people, the younger generation, to take over, uh, not to be afraid, uh, not to... Um, give in on the challenges that we are all facing. I want to encourage young, younger generation and young people to make the change, because if we don't fight every day for our values and the things that we believe in, then, then nothing is guaranteed. So I think it's everybody's job to do their part. It's my job to do my part, but I cannot do it alone. Not you, not everybody, not anybody can do it alone. But together, together, we can really change the world and we can change the future. The
I think, I think our festival members of yesterday would definitely agree to that. Um, and um, from the perspective of the jury, I've said it, you really developed uh, uh, a new political style in this, in this very strong dichotomy of, of being matter of fact, trying not to be left, you know, steered sideways um, away from reality and from the issues, one thing, and on the other, uh, have these strong val values which, which make sure that you they can follow a long-term objective. Um, is that what that, a conscious development? Did you consciously develop a political style or did this just come about? I really didn't. I really <laughs> didn't do it unconsciously. Um, I'm just me. I'm just me. I'm just Sanna. I don't want to be any, anyone else. Uh, I don't want to fit in some formula. And I think that it's really, really important that people can be themselves and still uh, be in those powerful positions. I don't think that we, any of us, should change ourselves uh, when we enter a political life or climb that democratic ladder. I think it's very important that we have diversity uh, in, in the group that makes decisions. I've been in many uh, meeting rooms, whether it's European Council or uh, the Munich Security Conference, Bilderberg or Davos, and what we see there is, sorry to say, uh, mostly older white um, men. And I don't want to see only that. White, older men are also welcomed, but not in 90%, not in 90%. We need more young people, we need more women, we need more people from different ethnic backgrounds, different backgrounds in general. We need diversity, and I think it's really important that you can be yourself and still make those decisions, still take a, take a stand and still make a difference. Definitely. Um, don't worry, by the way, I can take it. Um, all of us older white men can take it. Um, how, how is your value-based approach to politics different from just a sort of numbers-based kind of purely rational approach? Well, of course, as a prime minister or, or politician, uh, I have to use different kind of information, so also the numbers and, and everything like that. But, uh, but I think politics is also, um, it's also a social uh, matter. And actually, it was really difficult for me. I can make this, um, um, uh, I can say to you quite uh, honestly, that at the beginning, I wasn't socially uh, that conf comfortable or uh, very talented, actually. I was always focused so much on the matters and not about the social, uh, social dancing that politics uh, are really about. So actually, decision-making, it's a social process. You need to understand different views. You need to understand different people. And you really uh, need to understand what motivates people and, and why people think the way they do. And this was really difficult for me, but uh, during the years, uh, of course, this is also something that I have learned. Uh, so it's a social, politics or social matter, and, and you really need to understand people to make good decisions. So in, in the beginning... Not only understand numbers, actually numbers are easy. They are easy to, rem to remember. Uh, people are much more difficult. <laughs> um, did you ever have to compromise on these values in a conscious fashion? Well, we have a coalition government in Finland, so we, ha we have had five parties in the Finnish government, so of course I have to compromise in many, many uh, issues and matters that have been in the government stable, especially during these very difficult years in the pandemic, we had to tackle uh, with different values. On the one hand, we had to make sure that, that we are securing uh, people's life and health, but at the other hand, we had to also close uh, schools to go to remote uh, schooling. We had to make very difficult decisions on, on putting hobbies uh, aside that also affect, especially the children and the youngsters. Uh, and we worried about that, but we had to make choices between uh, values 
and we chose to value life and health during those difficult years. And now we have to make choices to make sure that all the children that have been uh, in many kind of, of troubles because of the, the pandemic restrictions that we had, we have to make sure that they can also cope and that we have to uh, also fix the problems that came uh, from the restrictions. So, of course, we have had uh, compromise on our values. We have have to find that golden path. Sometimes we made it, sometimes we made mistakes and learned from that. And I, I think also that it's very important that you are not afraid, too much afraid of making mistakes, but you must learn from that uh, and make sure that next time you will do better. That would be so nice, yes. If, um, <laughs> if that happened all the time. Um, how have your convictions helped you in the face of Russian aggression? Well, I think the situation in Ukraine uh, with Russia brutally attacking Ukraine, it's so black and white. This is a black and white issue. Uh, Russia has started an illegal uh, war, brutal war, and Russia is wrong. And we have to be very firm on this. I think we have to be very firm and we have to be very strong when it comes to Russia uh, today. I have said this also earlier in many occasions, but we have made mistakes as Europeans, as Europe. We have made big mistakes, especially in 2014 uh, when Russia attacked Ukraine, when Russia attacked Crimea. If we ha would have been more stronger then, if we have put more stronger sanctions, if we have reacted more strongly, I don't think that there would have been uh, war starting in Europe 24th uh, of February uh, 2022. I don't think that we have seen this day. Uh, so we have made uh, mistakes and that's why we need to be more strong now. And we have to make sure, we have to make sure that Ukraine will win the war in their, in their terms, that there will be just peace in Ukrainian's term. And we have to give them everything that they need. All the financial support, all the humanitarian support. We have to take refugees to our countries. Uh, we have to help them build back, build back uh, Ukraine. But especially now, they need arms. They need weapons, they need arms, they need to fight uh, Russian forces and push them uh, out of their country. Sana, do you still remember the moment when you learned of the attack in February 2022? I remember it uh, vividly. Uh, of course, we knew the previous evening, night, that there probably will be a uh, war site uh, in Ukraine the next day. Uh, it was quite early uh, morning uh, that we found out that the war has started. Of course, everybody hoped that this wouldn't happen. So when you go to sleep at evening, at night, uh, and you know something re really, really bad might happen, but you still want to believe that nobody is that um, mad to do these kind of actions. Uh, it's very, uh, the pressure, uh, it's, it's quite something, and the tension is quite something, and it's so sad, it was so sad to wake up very early that morning and learned that this madness is going on in Europe today. And did you know at this moment that, yes, you would join NATO as Finland? In that moment, yes, I knew. I knew that Finland will join NATO uh, because I know Finnish people. I know Finnish people and, and the mentality of Finnish people and why, it's, why it wasn't uh, so difficult for us to make that decision as a nation not as a politicians only, but the nation, the people's minds changed immediately when Russia attacked Ukraine. The Finnish mentality is to always secure and keep your country and citizens safe. We have been in wars with, with Russia. We have that collective memory, 
how was it? Uh, we have that collective memory also that we were too alone in war and in peace. And that's why Finnish people are also so strong when it comes to Ukraine, supporting Ukraine uh, any way we can. Because we have that uh, collective memory and we re really remember how was it. Uh, and everybody's family has those stories uh, of the war. So, so we have that uh, collective memory in Finland. So I knew uh, immediately that Finland will join NATO that uh, it would be a process that wouldn't take that much time. Uh, and I'm very happy that, that today Finland is a member of NATO and, and hopefully uh, very soon Sweden will also be. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe that's al already part of an answer to a riddle I've been trying to solve. Why is it the rather small, most threatened countries, in, you know, countries um, like Finland, but also smaller countries like Lithuania, that seem to be the most courageous in, in fending off Russian aggression? Is that because of the collective memory or is there something else? Well, I think... Uh, one reason is the collective memory. Uh, Finland was lucky in many ways. Uh, Baltic countries, Poland, uh, many others weren't that lucky. We, we fought war. It was awful. It was awful uh, those years of war. But we stayed independent. We stayed independent and we had the uh, right uh, to make, make our own future. We, we could uh, build uh, the welfare state that Finland is today. But many other countries weren't that, that lucky. They didn't have their independence. Uh, so, so that collective memory, I think, and that knowledge, what is it like uh, to be under uh, that power and, and how, how is it to be in war, uh, I think that is one of the reasons, the main reasons why so many Baltic countries, Poland, for example, are so strong when it comes to the aggression of, of Russia. Mm. Of course, the other great challenge, climate, doesn't just go away. I want to correct, yeah. we weren't only lucky, we were really tough on fighting Russia as well. <laughs> now I have a better idea of the collective memory, which, which definitely helps. The other great challenge just doesn't go away because of the war. And yet, do you think that our fight against climate change has been thrown back by the war? Well, of course, it's natural that now the world's attention or the Europe's uh, and the democratic world's attention uh, is in Ukraine. But I also see possibilities here. Uh, for example, the energy transition that we need to take, not only because of climate, but also because of security. We have been too dependent on Russian gas, we have been too dependent on Russian energy, and that has caused us a lot of problems. But now it's our opportunity to also make that transition, that transformation to greener energy, to build that European network of energy system. Together, I think this is a big opportunity and possibility for all the European countries to take a leap when it comes to tackling and fighting climate change. So there's also always um, different sides of a coin. There are problems, but there are also possibilities, and I think we have to also see that, that pride aside. Uh, we have to fight climate change. Not, nothing matters. Nothing matters if we don't do those changes that are required to make the world more sustainable. But we also have to make sure that we are doing those transformations socially just way. We have to make sure that people uh, can, e can keep up uh, on those changes, uh, that we are also um, making people's lives better. We need that support from ordinary people, and that's why the just transition is so important. For example, Finland. Uh, it was mentioned earlier today that Finland wants to become climate neutral by 2035. But we also see a possibility there to transform our economy more greener, to create more green jobs, new technologies, to have that economic boost also uh, within uh, our society and our economy when we are tackling climate change. So when, the climate, when climate change is our biggest problem, tackling climate change is our biggest opportunity. Yes, I, I, here I would clap a lot myself, I have to say. 
I think we actually we're seeing a new global competition around sustainability, right? Where you actually win as a nation if you have more of it, um, and and Finland is one of the front runners. Um, there is a certain advantage to being an older white guy. I've um, I've seen a couple of things, and and I, 20 years ago, I've spent two weeks in the southern Finnish town of Hemenlinna, which, believe it or not, at the time was termed the most innovative local community of the world. Um, and um, what we saw there, what I saw there, um, was a city that, that really listened to its citizens. And not only to its grown-up citizens, but also to its children. Like when children said, please don't build here because this is where we find our wild strawberries, they wouldn't build there, which at the time was a miracle. Um, so is that one of the secrets of Finland, that you do listen to your citizens? Well, I don't think that we listen to our citizens enough. <laughs> I think we, we do listen. Uh, that's very good. I think that um, live democracy needs citizens. It needs people to participate. Uh, but I think we all can do so much better. Uh, and I think cities, uh, the, that those local communities, municipalities, they are a key player, how we listen to our citizens. Also those citizens that, that don't always have the highest and more strongest voices. We need to listen to the children and also disabled people, people, people from different backgrounds, and make sure that, that we are listening to everybody, not only those that are speaking loudest. The local level is important, as is the European level. Now, what do you think can guide the EU in this time of conflict between autocrats and democrats, and also in this time of system conflict between the US and China? Where, where is our place to be, and what can guide us there? Well, I think Ukraine uh, is a stage uh, for a bigger uh, fight uh, of values in the world. I think there are so many actors in the world that are actually looking at Ukraine, what is happening in Ukraine, and how the dem democratic world uh, is facing uh, that war. I also think that the, the few, uh, that the few years that has now passed, pandemic, the uh, war, uh, energy crisis, many, many other challenges that we have faced, we have to learn from that. Uh, we have to make sure that, that we are not that dependent on authoritarian countries, that we are um, not that dependent uh, on countries that doesn't share our values. We have to learn, for example, the pandemic, uh, that we were too dependent on medical supplies, uh, medicines, uh, when it comes to, to many authoritarian countries. And during the war, we have learned that, that we don't have those defense capabilities our, ourselves. We need, for example, the United States and others to help uh, Ukraine. And we are very grateful that the states, for example, are so involved. But at the same time, we have to be very honest. We wouldn't cope without the United States uh, in, in Ukraine. Um, and also, uh, the war have, has taught us that we shouldn't have those energy dependencies on authoritarian countries that we have had uh, from Russia. So we have learned many lessons. And now we have to make sure that, that we are uh, following those lessons, that we have uh, that independency uh, together with our democratic friends, our partners, our trusted partners. We need that, that um, cooperation uh, between democratic countries and I think we have to be very careful when it comes to new technologies, digitalization, those digital solutions, because our societies are already so digitalized, but in the future our societies will be totally digitalized. And if we are uh, building those dependencies on, on authoritarian countries when it comes to technology, uh, digital solutions, and there are already too much dependencies on, on these matters, then we are putting our societies, our citizens, our economies in a big risk. And so this must be our wake-up call to make sure that we as Europeans, as European Union, together with our trusted partners, has those capabilities uh, when it comes to the digital solutions and new technologies. Otherwise, it's a big, big, big risk that will 
I think that it will uh, reveal itself in the future. By the way, <laughs> believe me that Finland is way more digitalized than Germany, and we would like to be more like Finland in that regard. Um, the, by the way, this sounded almost like an application to Brussels. Many people hope that this is where you... you it wasn't. <laughs> where you apply your Zizou next. Um, you are famous, we've said that already, for, for opposing the personalization of politics. You always say, well, there is more than one person involved. Um, the issue is more important than, than the politician. Um, why is that? Because I think that the issues, the matters, those uh, connect people. We are all here today because of future. We want to change the future. We want to uh, make sure that that future are built uh, based on the democratic values that we believe in. I think uh, the ideas, those connect people and people are only tools. So I don't see myself um, sorry to say, very important. I don't think that I'm important. What is important is that people together uh, want to make a ber world a better place. I want to make the world a better, better play place, but I cannot do it by myself. I cannot do it alone. So I think the ideas, uh, the matters, the, the issues that we believe in together, those are important, and together we can do uh, those changes that, that needs to be done. And yet, you are one of the few political stars in Europe. Be uh, believe it or not, the jury is very convinced of this. Um, um, and do you dislike the status, which is actually there, or do you think you can make use of it um, to follow your objectives? I don't really uh, think about it so much. Um, I, I think that the issues that matters to me um, of course, I want to change the world, and I'm, I'm very um, honored uh, of this prize, and I'm, I'm very um, uh, honored that I can do this uh, job as a politician. I think it's so important that people can, can uh, elect uh, politicians, that they can uh, elect the ones that, that uh, represents them, that leads them, uh, and I'm very honored to be part of that. Uh, but what matters to me are the matters. That's why I went into politics and, and that's why so many others uh, are in politics and want to uh, become, become leaders in the future. And there are so many young people here. I want to say I believe in you. You can do uh, so much. Uh, so there are future leaders among this, this audience uh, and I want to see what you can do uh, in the future. Um, Sana, we started with a Finnish characteristic, um, and let's also end with one. Uh, for a number of years now, Finland has, has scored at the very top of the global happiness indexes. Um, why is that? I'm not sure, has it been 10 years in a row, in a row that Finland has been chosen as the happiest, countries in the, uh, as the happiest country in the world? Um, of course, all Finnish people think, no, that must be that that must be wrong. No, we are not that happy. We are not that happy. But of course, the index uh, it tells you much uh, deeper happiness, not not only uh, cheerfulness or or the way people uh, are within their everyday lives, but it's uh, more deeper happiness that we have a society uh, that enables everyone to have a good life. We have that welfare society in Finland. We have opportunities from people from different backgrounds. We have a good, very good education system that enables uh, anyone to become anything. And I think that that is something that we need to cherish. Uh, and that is something that we need to make even stronger in the future. I'm from a very, very humble background, and without the Finnish society, without the welfare state, without our good uh, education system, I wouldn't be in this position today. So I think uh, it's an index, index that tells you much deeper kind of happiness, how the society is functioning, how the society enables people uh, to fulfill their dreams. You know, the, 
the um, <clears throat> Hamburgians are very proud of their city, but there's one fear that they have underlying, which is that weather is a problem and that weather is actually determining happiness. And luckily, you Finns show us that it's not at all. It can't be weather, guys. Um, so what does happiness then mean to you? What, apart from this award, makes you happy? So many things. Very ordinary things, of course, my own daughter, Emma, uh, who is five, uh, and, and she's so talented, much more talented than me at that age. Uh, so I have much hope for her that, that she will uh, really become something. And actually, she has said that, that she wants to become engineer and she wants to build um, a space rocket and also teleport for her parents. So I'm very, very happy about her and, and hopefully she will fulfill all those dreams. It would be very handy to enter, uh, to, to teleport to different places, for example, from Helsinki to Hamburg. It would have only taken a second. <laughs> so. Very ordinary things. You can also see that I'm a uh, Skiffy fan, so... so. <laughs> well, we certainly wish the whole Marine family all the best and we are so glad to have you here. Thank you so much, Sanna Marina. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. <laughs>